A main banker named Andy Dufresne is found guilty of killing his wife and her boyfriend, a professional golfer, in 1947. He receives two consecutive life sentences and is transferred to the notoriously harsh Shawshank prison because Maine does not have a death penalty. Despite Andy's repeated denials of guilt, everyone believes he is the one who committed the crime due to his cold and cunning personality. After serving 20 years in Shawshank for murder, Ellis Boyd Redding, Morgan Freeman, often known as Red, is currently being investigated for release. Red's parole application is denied despite his best efforts and conduct, but this doesn't bother him much. Red is then shown to be the neighborhood smuggler who can get prisoners anything they want as long as it is reasonable. All convicts are informed of the coming of visitors via an alarm. Red and his buddies wager on which new fish will experience a panic attack on his first night in jail. Red makes a sizable wager on Andy. During the first night, a recently arrived overweight inmate, called Fat Ass, breaks down and screams hysterically, allowing Haywood, William Sadler, to win the bet. The party is cut short when the main guard, Byron Hadley, Clancy Brown, violently beats up the overweight guy for not being quiet when asked. Meanwhile, Andy maintains his calmness. The convicts find the next morning that Fat Ass died in the infirmary because the jail doctor had gone away for the night. Andy asks Haywood for the man's name, but he declines. A month or so later, Andy approaches Red since he's heard he's good at discovering stuff. He asks Red to help him obtain a rock hammer, which he believes is essential for his passion of collecting and carving rocks. Red questions Andy about his reasons for doing so, but Andy laughs them off. Red agrees to provide the order and cautions Andy about, the sisters, a gang of inmates who commit sexual attacks on other inmates, particularly its leader Boggs, Mark Ralston, who has feelings for Andy. Red also agrees to give the order even though the other inmates think Andy is, a really cold fish, Red is drawn to him right away because he sees something positive in him. Red thinks that Andy is planning to use the hammer to create an escape in the future. But when he finally realizes the size of the object, he realizes why Andy laughed and joins in, dismissing the idea that Andy could ever use the hammer to dig his way out of jail. Andy spends the most of his time during the first two years of his imprisonment fending off Boggs and the sisters or working in the prison laundry. Andy is frequently beaten and raped but doesn't speak out about it since he continually fights them off. Red uses her connections to have Andy and a couple of their common friends placed on a work detail to tar the roof of one of the prison's buildings, providing everyone with a respite from the routine. Andy overhears Hadley complaining about having to pay taxes for a future inheritance while he is at work. Andy explains to Hadley how he might hide his money from the IRS by using it to make a one-time present for his wife, drawing on his experience as a banker. Then, in exchange for some cool drinks for his fellow convicts while on the tarring job, he promises to help Hadley fill out the paperwork, before agreeing to provide the convicts who are working cold beers before the task is completed, Hadley first threatens to throw Andy from the roof. Red says that although Andy may have created the privilege to win the respect of the guards as well as his other prisoners, he also may have done it just to feel normal again. While watching a movie, Andy approaches Red and makes another strange request, Rita Hayworth. Red is taken aback by the request, but he decides to place the order. Andy runs into the sisters once again as he leaves the theater. He manages to argue his way out of being raped, but after being severely beaten to within an inch of his life, he spends a month in the hospital. Due to the beating, Boggs is kept in isolation for a week. He discovers Hadley and his men waiting for him in his cell as he exits. He is taken to a prison hospital uptown after being beaten so severely that he would never again be able to walk or consume solid food. The sisters leave Andy alone and never disturb him again. When Andy leaves the hospital, Red and his buddies have left him some pebbles to sculpt with an enormous Rita Hayworth picture in his cell. After learning that Andy had assisted Hadley, Warden Samuel Norton conducts an unexpected cell check to assess Andy. While the guards are turning the cell upside down looking for illegal substances, he discovers Andy reading his copy of the Bible, and they chat about their favorite verses. The warden leaves after their interaction, almost forgetting to return Andy's Bible. Then he tells Andy that, salvation lies within, and urges him to keep reading the Bible. Later. Andy is informed that he will now collaborate with senior prisoner Brooks Hatlin, James Whitmore, at the library. 
The reason for his relocation becomes clear when a jail officer arrives and requests Andy's financial advice. Andy puts up a temporary workstation and gets to work. Giving most jail guards financial advice and assisting them with their tax filings. Andy also sees a chance to increase the jail library, so he begins by requesting funding from the main state senate. Every week he sends letters. Even guards from neighboring prisons seek out Andy's financial advice when they visit for inter-prison baseball games because they value his financial support practice so highly. Andy is also helping the warden with his tax filings. Soon later, Brooks loses it and threatens that he will murder Haywood if he is not released on parole. Andy is able to reason with him. After spending 50 years in Shawshank, Brooks has clearly been institutionalized, as his buddies point out when they debate his behavior. Red understands this. He is unable to get used to the outside world since he has practically been trained to live as a prisoner for the rest of his life. These walls are funny, says Red. You initially dislike them before coming to accept them. Once enough time has passed, you begin to rely on them. After being granted parole, Brooks moves into a halfway house. Moreover, he receives a job at a grocery, which he despises, meanwhile, he receives a job at a grocery, which he despises. He finally commits suicide after finding it unable to adjust to life outside of prison and leaves the note, Brooks was here, written on a wooden beam. Andy receives from the state for the library along with a selection of vintage books and recordings after six years of letter writing. The state senate believes that this will be sufficient to convince Andy to stop his letter writing campaign. But he is unconvinced and increases his efforts. Andy discovers a copy of Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro among the donated old documents when they are delivered to the warden's office. He plays the song over the prison's public address system while locking the guard charged with guarding the warden's office in the restroom. The music quickly has the entire jail entranced. Red observes that everyone felt liberated by the sounds of these women, if only for a time. Andy is told to switch off the record player by Norton, who can be seen outside the office fuming over the act of defiance. Andy reacts by increasing the volume. Hadley is instructed to break into the office by the warden, and Andy is promptly placed in solitary confinement for two weeks. When he emerges, he boasts to his pals that the duration of his time in the hole was the easiest time he had ever experienced since he had Mozart's Figaro stuck in his head the entire time. When the other inmates remind him how unlikely it is. He talks about the strength of hope in jail and how it may keep them going. Red vehemently disagrees with Andy, saying that at a place like Shawshank, hope is a deadly thing, and advises Andy to get used to life without it. Soon after, Red learns he has been imprisoned for 30 years at a fresh parole hearing. He speaks just like he did five years prior, but without any excitement. Once more, his parole is denied. Red responds by presenting Andy a massive Marilyn Monroe poster to honor his 10 years after Andy presents him with a harp to mark his 30 years. A young prisoner called Tommy, Gil Bellows, comes to Shawshank in 1965. Andy and Red make friends with Tommy because he is friendly, gregarious, and well-liked by the other prisoners. Andy advises Tommy to think about another line of business besides thievery because he seems to be not very good at it after Tommy confesses that he has been in and out of prison since he was 13 years old. The idea truly resonates with Tommy, who seeks Andy for assistance in working for a high school equivalency credential. Tommy is a good student, but even so, he becomes upset during the exam and folds it up before throwing it away. Yet, Andy gets it and sends it. Tommy asks about Andy's situation, which Red answers. When Tommy hears the tale, he appears distressed. He then shares with Andy and Red the tale of a former cellmate from a different jail who boasted of murdering a professional golfer at the country club he worked at together with his lover. The woman's banker husband had served time in jail for those killings. With this fresh knowledge, Andy meets with the warden full of hope and expects Norton to assist him in obtaining a new trial with Tommy as a witness. Norton's response is exactly the opposite of what Andy had hoped for. The warden gets angry and sends Andy to isolation for a month when he angrily states that he will never disclose the money laundering methods he set up for Norton over the years. Tommy receives word from the school board that he passed the test and has earned a high school diploma. In his private cell, Andy receives the news from a guard, who makes him grin a bit. Later, 
Tommy is taken outside in the dark to speak with the warden in private. He is questioned by Warden Norton about the truth of what he told Andy and about his willingness to testify on Andy's behalf. Tommy completely agrees. Before ordering Hadley to shoot the man dead, the warden smiled at him. When the warden pays Andy a visit in privacy, he informs him that Tommy attempted to flee and that Hadley was forced to shoot him. In response, Andy tells Norton that everything ends and that he will no longer be working for him. When Andy leaves isolation, he and Red have a chat in which Andy discusses how much he loved his wife and how he still feels guilty for her death even though he did not shoot her. Then, if he were to ever be released from prison, he would discuss his initiatives. He talks of his desire to spend the rest of his life in Zayuadaneo, a seaside town on Mexico's Pacific coast, where he would also like to run a hotel. He then asks Red if he'd want to join him, but Red replies that he thinks Brooks is too far gone and declines. Then, he blames Andy for allowing hope to affect his thinking in such a way, saying that doing so will only lead to his demise, Red is asked whether he is familiar with the Buxton main region as Andy accepts and prepares to depart. Then he describes to Red a very particular hay field with a big oak tree at the end of a stone wall. Then, he requests Red's assurance that, should he ever be released from prison, he will go for that oak tree and find something that was buried amid the stones, but he won't specify what it is. Red makes a commitment, but he worries about how his pal is feeling. When he finds out that Andy has asked Haywood for a six-foot rope, his concerns are only increased. Red thinks Andy may be on the verge of committing himself because he has finally reached his breaking point, before retiring in for the evening, Norton requests that Andy polish his shoes and dry-clean his suit. As the guards turn down the lights for the evening, Andy goes back to his cell. It was the loneliest night of Red's life, he says. The next morning, Andy is not in front of his cell as he usually is and has not returned the morning call. As he approaches Andy's cell, the guard screams at him for being late and expects to find a critically ill or dead Andy there. Norton is shocked when he discovers Andy's sneakers in his shoe box rather than his own. The alarm then sounds, alerting staff to a missing prisoner. Andy's cell is vacant as Norton comes in and demands an explanation. Red is brought in by Hadley. But Red maintains he is ignorant of Andy's plans, Norton begins tossing Andy's carved pebbles around the cell as he grows more aggressive and paranoid. He thrashes through and into the wall. A tunnel that is barely broken is shown as Norton pulls the poster from the wall. Red narrates a series of flashback scenes that indicate Andy trying to innocently carve his name on his cell wall when a piece of it fell off many years ago, not long after obtaining his rock hammer. He then spent years using his rock hammer to dig at night while concealing the soil from his work in his pockets, which he would subsequently empty during his morning stroll in the courtyard. Andy wore Norton's clothing underneath his own to his cell during the storms the night before, and he was fortunate that no one, even Red, saw Norton's sparkling black shoes on his feet. He put a lot of his stuff, some papers, and Norton's clothes in a plastic bag that he secured to himself with the rope he had requested, then he crawled out of his hole with everything in the bag. The tunnel he had dug took him to a spot between the prison's two walls, where he discovered a sewage main line. He smashed the sewage line with a rock multiple times in sync with the lightning bolts, ultimately breaking it open. After wriggling through 500 yards of the pipe's untreated sewage, in the water beyond the walls, Andy surfaced. Later, a search team discovered his jail uniform, a bar of soap, and a very rusted rock hammer. Andy enters the main national bank in Portland, where he had deposited Norton's money, as the warden and Red are learning of his brilliant escape from capture. He closes the account and leaves with a cashier's check while posing as Randall Stevens and carrying all the required paperwork. He asks them to ship a parcel for him before he departs. Along with Andy's written admissions and testimony, the box also contains Warden Norton's financial records, which are sent directly to the Portland Daily Bugle newspaper. Shortly after that, in order to cover the unfolding story, many reporters and the Maine State Police raid Shawshank Prison. Hadley is detained by the state police after being accused of killing Tommy. As the police knock on Norton's door, he returns to his desk, pulls out a little pistol, and shoots himself once in the head to end his life. After a little while, Red gets an unwritten postcard from Fort Hancock, Texas. Red interprets it as confirmation that Andy successfully crossed the border into Mexico and is now free. 
Red has some type of sadness since he misses his comrade, but he and his friends pass the time by discussing Andy's escapades, with some embellishments. Red tells the parole board at his subsequent parole hearing in 1967 that the term rehabilitated was just made up to support their position. Then he goes on to say how much he regrets his earlier deeds, not because he's in jail but rather because he realizes how bad they were. Finally, he asks the board to stop wasting his time and leave him alone, adding that he will have to live with that decision for the rest of his life. Finally, he is given parole. He moves into the same homes and workplaces that Brooks did. Even observing the message Brooks had inscribed on the wooden beam. He often passes a pawn shop with multiple firearms displayed in the window. The vow he made to Andy keeps him from considering trying to return to jail when he feels like he has no life outside of the prison where he has spent the most of his adult life. Red follows Andy's advice, taking a bus to Buxton, where he finds the stone wall he was told about. There is a sizable black stone, as Andy had mentioned. A tiny box with a significant amount of cash and instructions to come find him in Zewataneo sits below. However he doesn't specify the location just in case. Red is suddenly aware of the full potential of hope and is ecstatic about the emotions he is experiencing. Red breaches his parole and departs the halfway home after carving a fresh message that says, Brooks was here, so was Red. From where he enters Mexico. Just as Andy had hoped, the two buddies are at last reunited on a beach along the Pacific coast. We came to the end of the movie I hoped you enjoyed it. Kindly subscribe to the channel for more recaps.